after 11 months later, uh, bottoming off uh, uh, syndrome was happened, but there, there was no severe symptoms to undertake another uh, surgery. So the main goals of the vertebroplasty is pain relief and functional restoration to a degree that patients may return to their activities of the daily living. Bone straightening also is one of the goals. As you can see, 50 to 97 percent pain relief. Major complication rate is 0.2. Another change for spine surgeon, a patient with osteoporotic spine fracture who need open surgical treatment, reconstruction, fixation of the weak bones during the fusion procedure. In this patient, bone implant failure is the most commonly result of screw pull out or cut out. So maximizing the bone screw interface is critically important. Various techniques exist to minimize this condition, like extantible of alligator screw, augmented screw, cement augmentation can be done by open and fenestrated screw. Uh, PMMA augmentation has been shown to increase pull out rate by 150%. Case, patient with osteoporotic spine, no fracture, but after one month come to us with an osteoporotic painful fracture with, with VAS uh, score eight and paraparesis of lower leg, so neurological deficit. And T1, T2 sequences are still positive, so it is acute fracture on the horizontal view, severe degenerative stenosis Bef which was before diag diagnostic. So, decompression and stabilization with uh, construct and with augmented screw. Also, we do open vertebroplasty by anterior support, which is very important to support the, the anterior column. X-ray after surgery, other cases, that is a female also with a paraparesis and the right leg dominantly, MRI acuity fracture, a several all fracture osteoporotic, horizontal view, and we undertake uh, decompression and long construction with augmented screw and prevented vertebral thrust. Another case is doctor who will take a lot of corticosteroids overuse. So he come to us with acute fracture, acute fracture but before he, ha he had several old fractures. So overuse of corticosteroid, we made an MRI acute fracture, a long uh, construct and uh, fixation with the augmented screw. After six months, he do everything. So, prophylactic vertebrosity and long fusion construct achieve and hold better spine alignment and increase segmental stability. So, a patient, uh, he, she uh, were operated for degenerative uh, process of the lumbosacral, and after 14 months come to us with this gibotic uh, deformity, and we do a long construction. Actually, the old fixation, we continue to the thoracic five. So concomitant anterior fixation, decrease the strain of the fixation construct, increase stability. Cortical screw trajectory from caudi to cephaly, so big cortical, and from medial to lateral, increase the stability of the construct. Uh, case with uh, Osteoporotic fracture, but the uh, regionologist suspicion of the maybe malignant tumor. So she came to us with a uh, SESC score. So MRI compression and kifotic diabotic neurologic involvement indication for decompression. Corpectomy was done. Bone graft instead mesh and plate fixation. 
after six months, she didn't come for the second stage. So we removed the implant and we made long construction with the augmented screw and preventive vertebrae. So after two years later, we do the TBO calcaneal artery disease because uh, impaired gait of uh, equinovarus of the foot. So vertebroblasty and kyphoplastic have resulted in significant advances in the surgical treatment of this fracture. If uh, uh, pro appropriately indicated, patients who have neurological deficit, spinal deformity, and intractable the pain require open surgical reconstruction with argumentation. Thank you very much. Please fill out our post webinar survey and receive a personalized certificate of attendance. So don't forget to join us for your next events. Thank you again. So thank you very much, Professor Savetsky. Um, I think we move on due to the time uh, um, time issues, and um, I'm going to introduce uh, the next presentation. So thank you very much also from my side. And uh, I'm going to discuss with you about the fragility fractures in pelvis and standards in therapy. And uh, at first I would like to uh, demonstrate some background in epidemiology, classification and some treatment strategies. So probably you know the, uh, the epidemiology of pelvic fractures. fractures have like three different peaks. Usually, initially, they see younger patients with high energy trauma, and, in, and uh, we are going to speak today about patients who have um, fragility fractures. This, this usually associated with uh, uh, low energy trauma, like um, uh, fall from stand and uh, another trauma. But if you look for uh, like databases or look at big publication with a focus on polytrauma, you will mainly find here fractures like hip fractures, forearm, spine, humerus fracture. So um, pelvic ring fractures are um, somehow underrepresented uh, and not often focused in the studies, especially in the osteoporosis studies. And if you look to the publications, and you only actually found like a number of like 30 publications per year with a focus on osteoporotic pelvic ring injuries. So this uh, fracture uh, types or this um, uh, location pelvic ring, pelvic ring injury are very, very often under um, represented in, um, uh, in the research. And that's why I would like to stimulate research in this field. So especially, especially elderly, uh, female patients um, um, have a high risk to, to have um, pelvic ring injuries or pelvic ring fractures, like you see on the slide here. So it's a high risk uh, with the age, increasing with the age, and also female uh, female gender is here as a um, increases the risk for such fractures. And so the question is how we should classify such fractures. Probably everybody knows. And the Thai classification or the AO classification, young parties classification. But usually, these uh, injuries or these classification times are associated or related to high energy trauma. You see here on the, on the right, right side, for example, lateral compression type injuries, where you also the, see the, um, the demonstration of a, a rupture of ligaments and soft tissues. And uh, this is not usually not present in the geriatric patients, which are associated with the um, um, low energy trauma. So the soft tissues are usually not ruptured like it's shown in this classification and also not in the tile and the O classification. That's why. So there was a, there was a need uh, for a new classification. I think the group of Professor Romans has done a great job to define like fragility fracture uh, types um, um, and uh, using these 245 um, patients. And the, um, there are numerous publications uh, that were already published with a focus on inter-observer rehabilitation re um, re and actually show 
here that this uh, classification system is, um, is, is it has a substantial result or very satisfactory. So I would um, uh, that's why I would like to focus on this uh, classification and introduce a couple a couple of um, cases from our um, um, from some publication also from our hospital. The, the initial type of um, fracture, uh, fragility fracture type A and uh, type one and A B usually are an anterior fracture. Fractures you see it on the left side. It's a bilateral or unilateral fractures. And you see in the X-rays demonstrated here in the pictures. Usually you need to exclude the presence of posterior fracture very often. It's associated with edema, like here in the MRI. And um, if it's present, you need to discuss probably whether um, whether yeah the classification or. Uh, uh, or the fracture type is, um, or the, um, how they call it, the classification, you change the classification to FF, F, FFP2. But usually in these such cases, uh, you, you, you perform non-operative treatment and, um, and but you, you very often if you have present uh, fractures in the front, you need to, to exclude also fractures in the posterior area. So what about fragility fractures type two? This is the um, next step of the, uh, this classification. Usually you have non-displaced posterior ring injuries or fractures. You see in the fracture here on the backside um, or a combination anterior and posterior um, pelvic ring injuries. And uh, or, um, or like it's shown here, um, like uh, here's like a comminuted fractures or here like you see a fracture lines. Very often, yeah, it's um, also non-operative treatment. Um, it's enough in this patient, but in some case of, uh, cases, if um, non-operative treatment, conservative treatment is not successful, you need to try to do like uh, sacroplasty as were described, or as eye screw fixation, like it's shown here on the right side, or in uh, if you want to stabilize the ventral part of the pelvis, if patient has a um, pain mainly on the anterior part, you can use ramo screws or even external or internal fixation to stabilize this region. This is the one case from our hospital recently. There's a lady, she's, 20, she's 85 years old. She fell down and then um, <clears throat> you can see an ephemeral neck fracture on the left side and the fracture here with a CT scan on the uh, posterior, sac um, posterior and the sacrum and also in the anterior part, the pelvis. So in this lady, of course, we. She was subjected to a total hip replace, replacement here and also dorsal fixation, transsacral fixation um, of the pelvis um, from the uh, left side. There, sorry, the next type is a, a fragility fracture type three. <clears throat> it's usually, it's usually it's associated with a displaced unilateral posterior pelvic Greek fracture. It can be in the ilium, it can be in um, this eye joint, it can be in a in a sacrum, and it is A, B, or C. And usually, so um, there's a recommendation, of, uh, of course, initially with um, conservative treatment, but in the majority of cases, an operative treatment is here recommended. You need to discuss about dorsal and ventral fixation um, um, of the pelvis, mainly the percutaneous techni techniques um, um, uh, which are published and recommended here by different authors. Um, percutaneous fixation, the posterior part of the pelvis and percutaneous techniques <clears throat> in the front, rods, trans transsacral fixation, or in the front, in the anterior part, you can use plates, like it's shown here on the right, uh, on the right side, or internal or external fixation is also possible. It's one case from our department again, we have a um, patient 87 years old, and you see a displaced fracture here in the front, and uh, this is um, like uh, it is a minor dislocation, but of like three to four millimeters on the right side of the sacrum. And so we decided, uh, due to severe pain, to fix the pelvis here in the front with such a ramus, uh, with a, such a screw of um, um, of the ramus on the right side and the trans, um, and transsacral fixation. And this is a picture of the mobilization you see already here, a little bit movement of a uh, um, of the screw, but uh, actually it's usually a very stable fixation technique and uh, fixation uh, strategy. 
So the next type is a type four fracture is a displaced bilateral posterior pelvic ring um, uh, fractures. You see the fractures A is a, in the ilium in the in the, in the, in the sacrum and also is a anterior um, um, anterior fractures dislocated or not. And very often authors recommend here and um, is a, you, a need for fixation posterior and anterior. You can use different fixation techniques. The plates, there are probably numerous strategies with it, what can be, um, which can be applied here. So um, again, one case from our department is a patient 91 years of age. So fem she is female, she had already numerous fractures, like pertorchanteric fractures and spinal fractures in, in, um, before and after this fall, she had like this, this um, um, this um, open, uh, this, um, this eye joints on the both sides, the fractures on both sides here in the front. So that we decided only to fix here in the back and to, to let out the fractures here in the front. And then um, so this lady was still happy and um, it could be mobilized um, um, yeah, within the one week. So usually this is a, um, the treatment, um, the flow diagram, the type one fractures are usually treated, treated with uh, conservative. Type two are only treated surgically if it's not, if it's not possible and patient cannot be mobilized. In type three fractures, um, yeah, usually um, are recommended um, to, to, to treat it minimally invasive um, in either um, with posterior stabilization with the screws or rods and the combination with the anterior fixation and of course, if you have severe displaced fractures um, of uh, type four, um, you usually focus on uh, open reduction and even spinal pelvic fixation if needed, patient have a uh, severe pain. So what is the outcome? This is a published, this is a data published by Professor Roman and his team. Usually you see a, <clears throat> a reduced mortality in this group in patients who were treated operatively in, in comparison to conservative groups in this patient group and um, and um, similarly, and it was analyzed in type two fractures and type three and four fractures. Um, both um, groups um, seems to um, profit by operative stabilization. What about the uh, um, what is about the outcome? So the majority of cases have FFP two and A in, in A and C fractures and uh, fragility fractures to A is most frequent. And you see here that then uh, usually the patient had a lot of pain after fixation, after three marks, the pain could be reduced, but still many patients uh, still uh, report numbers of pain. And similarly, the mobilization, high numbers initially during six months. So it's no, uh, there's not complete reduction of uh, disability, but still you know, at least we could re um, reduce their um, severe cases. So in conclusion, there is increasing incidence of regality fracture in pelvis. So usually you can perform conservative treatment in type one and type two fractures. And if patient have severe pain, you can you can suggest um, a patient at fixation, percutaneous fixation of the pelvis. Minimally invasive techniques are recommended and safe and reliable usually. And um, and according to the data is um, um, which is uh, limited according to my opinion, according to the data, you can even reduce the mortality after one year. So thank you very much for your, for your attention and I um, uh, hope we can discuss it later. So I think we move on to our next speaker. And the next speaker is uh, Professor Hassani from North Macedonia, and he is um, uh, going to speak about hip fractures. Thank you, Roman. Dear uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, today I will talk about osteoporotic hip fractures, uh, maybe not presenting so much cases uh, like my uh, Professor Saevsky and Roman, but uh, I will give another another view of osteoporotic hip uh, fractures. You know that this these fractures it's a real geriatric epidemic, and the incidence has been doubled in uh, till the 1980s, and it's expected to be tripled till 2050. 
a focus on the geriatric osteoporotic hip fractures. And that's my understanding, the geriatric, even though in the literature is not defined so good, is the third part of the life. Even this constatation is not so precise and not so polite, but it's true. So if we look uh, at these uh, three uh, types of the elderly, we have uh, these army mom and dad. So the last two parts, they should be treated like young persons because they have uh, uh, they have the expectations as are very high. Although these are uh, very important hip fractures because uh, all for almost one third of our geriatric patients, that's the beginning of the end. Uh, they are the most contempt fractures and most neglected one and often operated by the youngest surgeon or residents under supervision that shows these uh, one of uh, the pub, uh, papers from Norway. Uh, there are a huge number that are operated of, uh, from a surgeon that has less than three year experience. They are still often in the shadow of other injured patients and they are uh, in the same paper, we will sh uh, show an interesting fact that they are often subject of non-standard treatment, also in the same center, but also in different hospitals. And there is an in adherence to evidence-based guidelines used in treatment of hip fractures in Norway. Also in Dutch is the same story published in this publication that I will uh, I, I show you. And also a paper derived from British National Hip Fracture Database shows the same. So non-permanent following of the guidelines put this patient in a significant risk of inequality in the treatment and for sure for in a poor outcome. But Bandhari and Sinkovsky disagree in this, this rigid treatment, optimal treatment, and they think that the surgeon's personal preferences and beliefs probably should have a major impact in the choice of treatment. In fact, Treating this patient is our responsibility. I talk to the patient about osteoporosis, but I never do DEXA scan and I never prescribe drugs for osteoporosis since it's not my expertise area. That's why we need to involve all the people in the completing our task on treatment of osteoporotic fracture, whether they call geriatricians or internists or endocrinologists or whatever. We are no longer single players in, our, in this game. Before, the big chief was responsible to decide almost for everything. Now, we are no longer decision makers on, on, on our own, even though we are still chiefs in our departments. The decision is quite influenced from other medical and non-medical professionals. This doesn't mean that it's, we are deprofessionalized, but we are going traveling from a generalist to a more specialist. This is a time must that we need to adapt and doctors need to adapt and others need to adapt in these circumstances. So to complete the treatment, we need a complex approach and we need a big cooperation between uh, medical and non-medical personnel and uh, the chief and the other artists in this game. Uh, that's why we need to know who knows in depth the problem and we can refer to this to these persons to decide for a specialist. That's why we need to focus apart from the technical, uh, our medical uh, uh, investment. We have to do a lot in a team building and team cooperation. If we go back to the hip fracture, now we know we all know that there is nothing new that the conservative treatment is all almost forbidden for. This is a, a slide from Professor Volpin uh, study, where the mortality is quite high. And this, based on these results and other the results, the conservative treatment bears a statistically higher mortality risk in geriatric patient. And the operation should be done as soon as possible. So a lot of uh, papers show also that, uh, that as soon as possible, is done the operation, it's better, it's uh, 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 decreasing the um, short term and long term mortality. Based on these results, early reconstructive surgery of femoral neck fracture in elderly patient is the preferred choice of treatment. That's why, again, I'm coming back to Norway. 
with uh, they have implemented in 2,230 uh, patients the fast track uh, strategy to reduce the excess mortality after treatment of hip fracture that is that is quite high and they have seen that 30 day mortality on the years going on the years is decreasing significantly and that's why like a conclusion of this part we insisting on separate orthogeriatric department with standardized treatment and fast track strategy for hip fracture patient and its implementation is very beneficial for osteoporotic geriatric hip fractures. If you look up what's new in the osteosynthesis, when I started to, to, to teach uh, traumatology before 20 years, maybe, uh, there we have been very satisfied with this kind of implants, the DHS and DCS, but it was only for A1 type of fractures. For A2 and A3, we have seen every second uh, X-ray, uh, post-op X-ray was like this. So we were not satisfied and looking for to find a solution of that. We have tried to improvise and to use this kind of intramedullary nails without angle stability to treat fractures. And that was seen that it's not possible to treat this kind of fractures or soda artrosis or whatever. Uh, nevertheless, we have tried to do much more perverse things to put so much hardware without any kind of angle stability. This is all from our clinical material. We have uh, without rotational stability with planned neck and collapse and collapse of the femur. So shortened planned shortening of the femur that nowadays is not more allowed. We have tried to put another screw to, to try trying to uh, to limit the rotation of this patient. And then we have uh, what we have done for advancing the implant stability. I think that there has been so much done in the science to increase the implant stability and implant strength, whatever it is, uh, uh, PFNA, wherever it is, uh, uh, sc uh, double screwing of the femoral head or a gamma nail or whatever. But what we have done to for encourage of the bone implant to the bone the bone and implant encourage uh we see very very much uh, it's eight percent in the literature cutout rates and they are always require a complex revision surgery so uh what has been done in this direction if we compare the helical blade and the integrated interlocking screw, uh, we can see that both of them are comparable in various deformation and both of them are comparable in femoral head rotation and both of them are much better than putting only a black screw in the femoral neck and femoral head. But we have, the science has gone so, so far, we are using augmentation like, uh, like uh, to enhance the implant anchorage. And this is also from our clinical material. It's uh, augmentation significantly increased the stability of the neck and head uh, fixation comparing with a, a leg screw and helical blade without augmentation. If we continue to talk about advancement in the treatment of hip fractures, fragility hip fractures of the B-type or the, the neck, the femoral neck fracture, then we should think about the osteosynthesis and we see going from an old-fashioned um, uh, uh, screw, uh, uh, putting screw in the, in the femoral neck that has no angle stability and no rotational stability and planned neck collapse. We went to a new, uh, new uh, implant that has been introduced uh, recently and that recently is not so recently. Uh, that's uh, coming from our clinical material that is not an, uh, uh, it's, it's quite, quite good video that shows how we do this, uh, this fixation and how we do compression with a rigid angle stability and with locking screws and with the sliding stabilities, possibilities for compression like you see in the video. And there is anti-rotation ability and also it's a small footprint with a minimal invasiveness. So 
Also, the endoprosthesis with uh, partial and total hip replacement is a routine and a long time fighting between the orthopedic surgeons and the trauma surgeon, what is the best. But uh, when my spouse is an immunologist, and we are discussing very often, and she's saying that you are an old-fashioned probably because you are looking at the literature that has, it's older than five years, and they are looking at the literature that is older than five only months. So is there something that has been left to do in this direction of advanced uh, uh, mechanical technology? Uh, in following all these last seminars, we can see that there is nothing new in advancing the mechanics of the plates and screws and hips and uh, of, for treatment of fractures of a uh, hip. So probably we, have, uh, we are very close to the top of this mechanical technology and probably it's time now to think about changing on molecular and on other biology and not only going to do uh, uh, more stronger implants for our for our future so thank you uh, very much we have talked about development of modern fracture care let's say uh, of these fractures following of the guidelines going from generalist to specialist but taking again the complete responsibility i have talked about standardized treatment and fast track strategy for hip fracture patient and the question that is open or we are at the top of mechanic technology development and not the at the top of uh, molecular or biology development and we have to do to everything to decrease this excess mortality and to uh, enable our beloved oldest to live beside us as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hassani. Um, very interesting talk. So we move on. Hopefully after all this presentation, we'll be going to discuss, uh, have a couple of minutes. Next speaker is um, focusing on a very and really relevant topic is um, a periprosthetic, periprosthetic fractures of the femur. And speaker is um, Dr. Uh, Georg Osterhoff from, from Leipzig, Germany. And uh, Georg, thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Yeah, thanks Roman uh, for the introduction, dear chairman. Thanks for inviting me today. I'm gonna to talk about uh, periprosthetic um, femoral fractures. Well, we know that um, the prevalence of total hip replacement, total hip arthroplasty, and total knee arthroplasty has increased during the last decades, especially in the age group uh, of patients around uh, age around 80 years. And uh, at the same time, this is a cohort that has an increasing incidence of femoral fractures. So we have more patients with uh, hip and knee replacements, and we have more elderly patients, and these sustain more femoral fractures. So the result is that we will see uh, an, a dramatic increase of uh, periprosthetic femoral fractures. And these are defined as a fracture of the femur in presence of either uh, a THA and or a TKA. Most of these fractures actually occur during surgery, so as intraoperative fractures. But we are today going to talk about postoperative fractures, those that happen uh, not due to the initial uh, implantation of the THA or TK, but later after months or even years. Most of these uh, occur at the femoral shaft uh, more than uh, more frequent uh, compared to the distal femur and only very rarely in the very proximal part like the, the greater trochan. If we look at THA, uh, periprosthetic fractures around the, the THA, uh, then it happens much more frequently in uncemented um, uh, uh, total hips. Uh, this is why many of the uh, registry um, uh, recommend to go for cemented uh, implantation in elderly patients. And other risk factors are aseptic loosening, which is something we see in almost all of the periprosthetic fractures, uh, increased age, uh, BMI and, of course, an impaired quality of bone. So this is actually what we are going to talk about today. So the goals of treatment 
are pretty much the same as for just a normal femoral fracture. You want to achieve fracture union, you want to restore the alignment, and you want the patient to be able to return to the pre-injury level of function without pain. But as you have an implant in there, you also want the stability of the implant in the bone, and you need for this if you don't have If you have impaired bone stock, you need to restore adequate bone stock. And as these are elderly patients, you want to allow them to fully weight bear as soon as possible. You all know uh, the Vancouver classification would uh, start with peripostatic fractures about uh, the hip. Do you all know the Vancouver classification for the uh, A-type? AG is a, an avulsion of the greater trochanter, and AL is an avulsion of the lesser trochanter. B1 is a fracture at the level of the femoral stem, where the implant is, uh, is um, well anchored in the bone. B2 is a fracture at the level of the stem with a loose uh, stem, but good bone quality. B3 is a fracture at the level of the stem with impaired bad bone stock and a loose uh, stem. And a C fracture is one below the tip of the stem. Now, how do we treat them? Usually, uh, most of the greater trunk avulsions can be treated non operatively as long as they're. Uh, undisplaced, if there is displacement more than two centimeters, or this is what we do in our uh, hospital, if there is a functional deficit after you let them walk a bit, or if there is a big osteolysis, then you might in some cases go for uh, open reduction internal fixation, although this is really rather a rare thing. Lesser trunk um, avulsions, usually you treat not opportunity. So Vancouver B1 <coughs> fractures those at the level of the uh, of the stem where the implant is still uh, fixed to the bone. This is a fracture you can see uh, extends uh, below the fracture uh, below the stem, but up to the level um, of the of the stem. So in these cases, we usually uh, like in this 90 year old uh, woman to a CT scan. And even here, it's still difficult to tell whether the implant is still fixed, so we usually, if we think it could work, we start with um, locking plate fixation. And of course, the, the challenge is to get your screws past the stem, and you need uh, uh, variable angle locking plate uh, systems um, and circlages to do this. So what I try to do, as you can see here in an axial view, is I try to get some locking uh, screws in front and uh, in the back of the of the uh, stem, and if you use uh, cables or circlage wires, then sometimes it helps to use the circlage positioning pins uh, that you can attach to most of the peripostatic plate systems available on the market. But you have to be you have to uh, consider that up to twenty percent of the B one fractures um, turn out to be actually B two or B three fractures. So with a loose implant, and in these cases, you, you must have uh, revision arthroplasty in the back end. You must have the expertise and you must have the implants available if you go start to do these things. The two fractures are those with, uh, at the level of the stem where uh, the, the, the implant is loose, but the bone stock is good. Here you can go for uh, either uh, for a long uh, revision um, or femoral stem and um, do an open fixation of the fracture fragment as we did in this case. So this is actually quite a very long uh, stem, but it was necessary in this case, and then we fixed the fragment with wires. In B3, you have a loose implant and bad bone quality, so here you need to add some biology. And this is usually done by a revision stem and thermal allograph, as shown here. In Vancouver C, those here can actually be treated just as femoral chest fracture with a uh, locking plate fixation. But as you again need to get past the femoral stem uh, with the screws, and uh, you need a certain uh, uh, um, system that has the uh, optionality of variable uh, angle screws, and uh, as you see, I can as well. And so much wise as to need uh, this. Now, we're going to talk about peripatetic fractures about the knee. So
So he's a, the, the, the most common classification that you can find in the literature is a sleep classification that divides uh, the textures again similar to the Vancouver classification in type one, well above the shield or the implant type two extending uh, until the the the, uh, the tip of the the shield and type three below the femoral shield. Uh, as we have a, a wide variety of, um, of uh, knee arthroplasty with revision knees uh, being uh, present and being prevalent more and more, um, we are using uh, this classification described by Fackler and uh, colleagues, which also which combines the suit classification or aspects of the uh, suit classification with different implants. So if we go through these um, and start with just the surface replacement and a fracture uh, that is above such a, a surface replacement, you can just go for a <coughs> plate fixation or uh, intramedullary relay, uh, nail, as you can see here. We prefer to do a nail if we can and if the, the box is open of the femoral shield, because uh, wh where I, I made this arrow, you can see how this interacts, interlocks with the femoral shield and provides extra stability and we, these patients can immediately full weight bear. If you have a fracture that extends well below or until the femoral shield, then you can try um, plate fixation. This is really a borderline case and the, our experience is that these uh, tend to often fail. And also, if you look at the literature, then you can see that um, up to 25% after plate fixation uh, actually fail. So we more and more tend to go for revision knee arthroplasty in these cases. This is another case where we uh, went for uh, a revision knee with long stems and where we then added uh, fixation around the stems to not uh, have to use a, uh, a, a tumor prosthesis like implant. So if you have uh, posterior stabilized uh, fixations, you rather go for plate fixation. If your stem gets longer, uh, you also in type one and type two can sometimes try to um, go for plate fixation as I did in this case. But uh, as soon as the fracture extends uh, around the stem and uh, to the, to the uh, distal part of the femur, you need to go for a distal femur uh, revision total knee arthroplasty, as can be seen here. The same is if you have a distal femur replacement, then of course your distal femur replacement has to get longer. And then there's the special situation uh, that we also see more and more is that we have kind of interprosthetic fracture. So you have a THA and a, a TKA, uh, preferably with a lot of cement in the shaft, as you can see here. Uh, but in these cases, these behave like a Vancouver C or a, a, a Fakla 1. So basically, again, this is just the shaft fracture and this is how we treat it. But of course, uh, we need to get, um, uh, or need to pass the stem of the hip implant again, but this uh, is quite an easy one. Another one, this is a Vancouver C, but it extends uh, to the very long uh, knee uh, arthroplasty uh, stem. So in this case, again, I tried to do a, a play, plate fixation, but here I had lot, lots of more trouble to get around the stem. So in these cases, what I sometimes use are these attachment plate, you can, attach these to, to, the, uh, uh, to the large plates, and then you have the ability to get some small uh, angular stable screws around the stem. So it is another interprosthetic fracture, uh, but very proximal. So it's basically a Vancouver B1 and a Fakla 1. So again, these we treat like a B1 Vancouver fracture, uh, but extending the plate, uh, <coughs> overlapping the distal uh, TH uh, uh, knee uh, implant, as you can see here. And then of course you can have uh, super prosthetic uh, fractures like this one. So you have a revision, long revision implant in there, and then you have a fracture that actually, we did, saw this on the CT, it extended uh, 
to the into the knee into the femoral condyles. So in, yeah, there you do not have any options left. And uh, fortunately, this is very very rare. But in cases like these, you uh, sometimes have to do a total femur. So if you look at the outcome, um, if you look at periprosthetic fractures around THA, then you see that uh, open reduction internal fixation actually has non-union rates uh, below or up to 10%, which is less than I would have expected, but this is what the literature says. Um, usually no grafting is necessary uh, with less invasive techniques, so I try to just uh, insert or <coughs> Um, try to do a lot of part of the plate fixation percutaneously, uh, then you have a good biology. The mortality is actually is around 11%. Some studies actually say more, but the, the, the large ones say around 11%, which is quite high, but not really for this cohort. Um, revision total hip uh, arthroplasty compared to open reduction internal fixa fixation has a worse functional outcome uh, than revision for loosening and potentially a lower mortality compared to open reduction internal fixation if you look at the literature, but the studies are small. If you look at periprosthetic fractures around the knee, then um, with intramedullary nailing, you can achieve up to 100% union, again, small sample sizes in all of the studies and you have malalignment with short nails, so you should go for long nails. Uh, locking plate fixation has uh, higher union rates, so if you can, if the implant allows, if you have an open femoral shield, then go for intramedullary nailing. And distal femur replacement has revision rates up to 50%, so at the knee, around the knee, try to do fixation. So I can conclude. Periprosthetic femoral fractures uh, include a wide spectrum of injury patterns from the hip to the knee. Um, the key is to detect implant loosening and to address this uh, appropriately. If there is no, if the implant is well anchored, if there's no loosening, then you can gauge for, uh, go for fixation. Usually, uh, usually locking plate fixation is the workhorse in uh, some. Uh, uh, periprosthetic knee fractures, you might rather uh, use an intramedullary nail, though. There's different techniques to improve your anchorage of fixation. I showed you some of them. You have uh, um, specialized uh, implant systems on the market, and whenever you can try to go less invasive to improve union rates to, uh, uh, to allow a better healing um, with good biology. You should always be able to switch to revision because often it can intraoperatively it can reveal that your implant is actually loose. And in these cases, you must have the expertise at hand to switch to revision. The outcome, functional outcome in those patients who survive is, uh, is actually good, but the general morbidity and fertility. Thank you very much. So I'm asking, uh, I'm asking, uh, uh, Siko, do we have time five for next for like five minutes for questions? If it's possible to have it, five minutes. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I just start with the first question, Professor um, Volpin. So if you do minimal invasive techniques, uh, this is long key wires. When do you remove them, and how is it, how is it? How is your uh, treatment with the physiotherapy? When do you start with it? I usually remove them after four to six weeks and then start the mobilization. At the beginning, I'm doing passive. And then if the patient is uh, okay and relaxed, then we go to active more and more and more. And as you saw, the results are very, <clears throat> are very good in most of the patient when you do it. And uh, I just want to mention one thing that was not mentioned in the four first lectures. The most important thing after doing these operations 
is to send your patient to good endocrinologic advisor because almost all of them, the elderly patients are without any anti-osteoporotic treatment. They come to you, most of them, they didn't get any uh, drugs or any help to prevent the uh, osteoporotic, and this is in order to prevent or to try to prevent the second fracture. And we see it usually in the hip fractures. About 10-15% of those that had hip fractures are coming within uh, the first one or two years with another fracture of the second hip. Another fracture of the second hip, and you have to open the also. And the results of uh, rehabilitation are therefore lower. This is one, and the second thing that I wanted to add Ed, that I was very happy to see that in most lectures, except our friend with the periprosthetic, if it is possible, we have to go to do minimal invasive surgery, the results are better, and then uh, you can see it in the spine, you can see it in the hip, you can see it also in the pelvic, where you did fixation with screws instead of plates or what, whenever it was possible to do it. Thank you. So this is a good method. Thank you. Um, Professor Savetsky, do you perform in every patient an MRI to distinguish between fresh and older fractures? Important and imperative because only with an MRI we can diagnose the presence of acuity, acuity of the fracture because only acuity diffracture or fracture itself uh, indication for vertebroplasty. So, okay. So in conservative treatment, how long do you wait until doing your surgery? Usually the patient come after two, three weeks. So uh, the surgery for vertebroplasty can be done from three weeks to the three months. No, no more, because after that it's a chronic fracture. No effect. Okay. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, Professor Hassani, it's a very short question. So, do you distinguish? I mean, elderly patients are also different. In some of them are more active, some of them are not. Do you do you have some uh, different, um, like strategy, or do you use different scores how to treat them in the hip fractures, or do you have like similar strategies? So you know, generally, some are active, some not. Yeah, generally, we divide them in three groups. Uh, but we don't use any score to, uh, to uh, classify them about, uh, let's say, activity and biological A. In general, we, <coughs> we have like uh, three groups and we say that the, there are highly active uh, elderly patient. I have had now 18, 85 years old that has fallen from a tree with a, a pelvic pseudoarthrosis that has been a case that we need to treat like really like a young person because he want to climb again in the tree and then we have in the patient in the wheelchair so and in the middle is the group the, the mostly that are physically active active uh, thank you and uh, georg one question from our side so sometimes i have the difficulty to distinguish between b1 and b2 so you do a ct scan it's not really clear is it's is it fixed, is it stem or not? How is your strategy? Do you do something different or? No, so a standard is CT for sure. And you, you need to talk to your radiologist to get uh, metal artifact reduction uh, uh, sequences or, or um, also for CT. And that's, that usually helps, but very often as you saw in my cases, you can, it's difficult to decide. So this is uh, what you, sometimes rarely what we do is uh, if we really want to know and we do traction radiographs. So you, you do a, bit, a little bit of traction, uh, do an X-ray, and then you can compare the, the X-ray before and that under traction. And if you see a difference, this is a very low cost and, and uh, good solution, but it's sometimes it can be a bit painful for the patient. So this is, and as I said, up to 20% of the fractures turn out to be loose, even though in the CT and on the X-ray, you think it was it was fixed. So this is um, you have to have the availability to convert to revision orthopathy. What also can help you is to have radiographs from earlier. So we call the the hospitals where the patients were before, 
and we ask them for the pictures from five years ago if they're available. And if you then see a difference, then, then uh, that helps. Professor Volpin, yes. Yeah, I want to ask Joe's because I didn't mention him in my discussion. In cases of distal femur fracture, obok of one, meaning in the distal third, you spoke about intramedular nailing. Which type you are doing, anti-grade or uh, retrograde? Retrograde. I, ah, okay, because yeah. I have very good experience with the retrograde femoral nail. Very short operation, very good for the patient, safe, without any problems. Absolutely, absolutely. Minimal invasive, best union rate. So if, if that is possible, if you have a femoral shield where you can get your nail through, then it's, it's the optimal solution. Yeah. What's about uh, distal femoral fractures following total hip? Did you try retrograde nail? No, no in these cases we don't. Okay. So I did I did few cases with retrograde nail. I put the nail up to the almost touching yeah. the distal stem and uh, also very good results after it. Yeah, okay. I'm a bit afraid about the, the shear stresses at the both tips. I said. Short yeah. distance between them, you don't okay. have any electric problems. These are nail of similar okay. metals, etc. Try it once, you'll see. It's, I will. Taking, it's taking half of the time. Good. <laughs> I will. <laughs> so, any comments yeah. or just to remind one thing, Roman, yeah. to the whole audience. Uh, we had a guarantee from the Sico Journal to publish a paper all together, all, all the five of us about the fragility fractures. We don't need to pay any money for that. First time in SQL that I heard the history and I am many years mm -hmm. in SQL. So those of you that want to join us, I think should they write a paper of two pages, let's say, in large abstract with pictures showing whatever you want to say and conclusion, and we can join it to, together. We'll, I'll ask Roman to be the first author. Okay, Roman? If Professor, right. we can discuss it later because we're still online. You know? Uh, no, no, but this is secret Judah. <laughs> so you'll start with that, and everybody else will join you. And at this part, so we'll have a nice paper in the secret journal about fragility factor of this webinar. Mm -hmm. So those of you who agree, Please call Roman and join him, okay? Apart from him, thank you very much. I'm very happy to congratulate Roman. Mm -hmm. He replaced me this year as the chief chairman of the trauma committee for another two years. So I wish you all the best, Roman, with that. You'll get any support from me, of course. And I'm responsible now from CCOD on the speciality trauma cluster that will be always on the first day of the Congress, Wednesday. And uh, we have to, to build it already. So thank you very much to come and to present in my behalf. Roman, you want to conclude anything? No, I just would like to thank uh, everybody, all speakers. I think this, these were very interesting presentations and uh, we see each other in the Congress. Thanks. Those we will live. <laughs> Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you all again. <laughs>